I sailed for a few years and I had two distinct in instances where ships lost power. And I can tell you that the worst feeling and the worst sound you ever hear on a ship is silence. <laughs> podcast at the National Museum of the Surface Navy in affiliation with the Surface Navy Association's Battleship Iowa chapter. And we are coming to you from the Associated Foundation's training room aboard Battleship Iowa. We're starting off season three today. We're pretty excited about it. And we're going to jump in and do introductions really quick. As ever, I am Marianne Fingler. I'm communications here at the ship. I run the podcast as a producer. And to my left is... Kyle Abbey, the development director aboard. It's nice to be back down in the train center. Woohoo! Been a little while. Yeah. And to my right, Mike Getcher, uh, oh gosh, long title executive vice president, chief operating officer, chief engineer, head cook, bottle washer, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then joining us online all the way from the East Coast, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Sal McCogliano. I'm a maritime historian over at Campbell University, and I host a YouTube channel called What's Going On with Shipping. And you've been a little Fantastic. busy lately. Been a little busy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, there's been some news going on on the East Coast, just a little bit. Well, before we get into that, talk to us about how you got started doing a podcast on shipping. Yeah, that was a complete accident, let's be clear. Uh, that's, <laughs> uh, there, was, there was no plan for that. So on March 23rd, 2021, uh, Motor Vessel Ever Given went uh. sideways in the Suez Canal. Mm hmm i had been I, I had sailed for years in the merchant marine and i worked ashore and then i went the academic route and became a maritime historian i, I got a master's in maritime history and nautical archaeology from east carolina university and then a phd in military and naval history from the university of alabama cool and so i'd been basically teaching that was my goal and i was really focusing on maritime history however in 2008 I became an adjunct for the u.s merchant marine academy i started teaching a course on maritime industry policy so it really got me kind of hooked into what's going on with the industry today. So I was looking at the past, looking at the present, and I started writing some articles. I started writing for G Captives, an online news magazine. And when Ever Given went sideways in the Suez, the CEO of, of uh, G Captain got a call from the BBC. And the BBC said, uh, we would like to get somebody on to talk about container ships and, and not just ever given but in broad uh, strokes and John the, the CEO couldn't yeah. do it because it was his daughter's birthday so he called me he said can you do it I said sure I'll do it went on the BBC World News uh, had about maybe about a two three minute hit uh, the uh, I was asked to hang on for a minute the producer came back on and said that was really good he goes you you were able in a very short period of time to talk about the ship the history and the economic impact because usually that takes three people you did it in a, in a good way. And I said, well, I appreciate that. I'm sure you say this to all your guests. He goes, no. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, we're BBC. He goes, we're English. We don't do that. <laughs> we, we hand out compliments very rarely. Uh, he said, but we're going to give you some calls, and you're going to be very busy. And, and I did. And, and it, in a weird thing at my university, I teach at Campbell. I also do broadcasting. I help uh, do, I was a lacrosse player. We started a lacrosse program. I got asked to do color commentary. So I kind of got used to broadcasting. So and then we had COVID, which made us all broadcasters, all podcasters. And, and so yep. all that came to bear. And, and I did my broadcast and I had a YouTube channel like everybody kind of does when you log into YouTube. And I had posted a couple of videos for some presentations I did. But, you know, my buddy John and I sat there and said, hey, let's do a video where we just talk about Ever Given. So March 24th, I did a video. Me and John for maybe about 30, 45 minutes, we talked about it. And the day before, I had three views on my YouTube channel. That day, I got like 3,000. I was like, oh, oh wow. this is great. It's like, <laughs> I, I opened up a thousand times. This is fantastic. I'm, I'm like, I'm excited about it. And so I just started doing like daily videos on, it was called What's Going On in the Suez? What's Going On in the Suez? Because Ever Given was stuck. Everybody was interested in it. So John and I and a few, we got some guests in and we talked about it. And then uh, Ever, uh, Ever Given got unstuck. But then it got arrested and was held in the Suez. So it was like it kept going on. It was great. So I kept doing these videos as we get information. And then finally, I wish I knew I had a, a subscriber or a viewer sat there and say, hey, Sal, you know, there's more ships out there. You can talk about other things. 
I was like, huh, I hadn't thought about that. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, so I started talking about other things, and it became what's going on with shipping. So it, it went from three views on March 23rd of, of, of 2021 to today where I'm sitting at. Sorry, I don't even know where I'm sitting at these days. Uh, I, I'm sitting there right now with something, with something right? like 270,000 subscribers. Awesome. Uh, and just the past couple of this past week with what happened with the Dolly, uh, several videos that went over a million views, which wow. is just in, insane for me. I just, I, I'm just very surreal for me to to, to be uh, processing that. That's yeah. amazing. Where where did you you sat for your license after going to the, to the, an academy? What did you do? Yeah. What was your path there? Yeah, I went to uh, State University of New York Maritime College. Yeah. Both so John and I actually did yeah. it. So we went to uh, New York Maritime. I uh, got my third mate's ticket. I got a BS in marine transportation. So that's my background in understanding shipping and logistics and ports. Uh, sailed for four years, worked ashore for four years, uh, largely with the Navy, the Military Sealift Command. But uh, yeah. when I went ashore for <clears throat> MSC, I was dealing with commercial firms. Uh, I did a float prepositioning for the Marine Corps and then with the Army and then chartering of vessels. So it gave me a good kind of well-rounded uh, oh, wow. element. And, and in truth, one of the things that, that I like is that we have a face group, Facebook group of all alumni from my university. And so whenever a, a maritime issue happens and I have a question, all I got to do is send a note out and yeah. I get 10,000 responses back from people who know either about it. I just, you know, I, I had a question about emergency generator on a ship mm -hmm. and a buddy of mine who's chief engineer on a ship filmed the video. He's like, okay, this is how the emergency generator works. And, and, and nice. it's great. It's like kind of you guys with a backdrop of a battleship. I, have, yeah. I got a backdrop of... of maritime people out there in the industry you know it's interesting we do want to talk about the dolly a little bit because of the, the references we have here in the, in the main channel of, of la harbor interestingly my phone is blowing up the morning of that event too um in fact by other port pilots who are saying hey you know look at this and interestingly one of my first suspicions was in fact the emergency generator and i have a story on that too real quickly sal my background is kind of uh, odd as well i'm not really a house piper but i i ended up uh sitting for my license for uh, unlimited thirds, sailed for a uh, better part of four years, got about a thousand days of sea time, most of it on medium speed diesels and, you know, search and survey research vessels, kind of interesting work, a little bit different, not the big uh, stuff, but the license was unlimited. Marianne uh, sailed uh, tall ships and uh, handled ropes. She, frankly, she handles ropes better than anybody else aboard the vessel here. <laughs> So uh, really good, and and poor Kyle has probably got a rowboat at home, I think. But yeah, we grew up in a little twenty six foot boat. I get seasick, so I stayed on. I've had time, yeah. It's all good. Yeah, so so uh, I had the opportunity. I actually sailed on Comfort Mercy sister ship right up the river, from okay, you, uh, right up the the bay from you guys there. So uh, I'm very familiar with uh, the vessels, and, and I've been in and out of L.A. and Long Beach myself a few times. Yeah. Interestingly, the, the Navy literally called our boss uh, when the Mercy mission came to L.A. during COVID. Um, you know, there was no real direct connection between the Port of Los Angeles and the Navy, even with, you, you understand what DISC is, Defense Support of Civilian Authorities. Yeah. They were still trying to figure out those relationships. So literally, the boss was called. He connected him with the chief of police, port pilots, Gene Soroka, all those people. Um, and then I ended up with COVID that week and literally was laying at home uh, texting with my boss, sh sharing with him how to land Navy helicopters in our parking lot. So it, really interesting. We're in a really unique position here. And we, in fact, had a shore contingent aboard the battleship during the entire Mercy mission. They could not go to the Mercy because of the fear of, you know, cross-contamination. So uh, we actually uh, stood up and, and helped the community in that way. So really kind of cool to do that. So the, the reason, or one of the reasons we wanted to talk was we've been, we've been concerned about an elision, it is a term, yeah. um, you know, here on the main channel of the Port of Los Angeles. If well, one of these- Well, time out, let's define elision because when I posted something, Sal actually shared one of your podcasts on our yeah. Facebook page the other day, and I used the word elision in the caption and got questions like, huh, what's that? So yeah. let's talk about <laughs> it, what an elision is. It's funny, is. yeah. Obviously, yeah, I mean, a ship so, hitting I a mean, bridge. <laughs> collision is, is basically when two vessels strike. And the collision yes. is when one vessel strikes either a stationary vessel or a fixed structure. So right. in the case yeah. of the dolly, that's an elision where, where the dolly hit the bridge in that case. And with Iowa being more, you know, fairly permanently where it is or on a, a consistent basis, that would be an elision. Just had one happen out in the uh, Persian Gulf with a uh, British minesweeper uh, backing down into a dock. 
Wow. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. So we are, in fact, at the turn of the, the main channel in the city, the port of Los Angeles, and we have these 100,000 ton container ships coming north. Uh, you know, if they lose steerage, if they have an unstart on their diesel, if something happens, you know, we, we have a challenge. Um, you mentioned us being moored. It's really interesting. The jurisdictions here are kind of fascinating. The night that we tied up here on June 9th of 2012, the Coast Guard called me up and said, Mike, we're done with you. You're no longer a ship. From their perspective you know we're a building literally from their point of view um, and then from the city of los angeles point of view building department wants nothing to do with this that's all good so we're a ship from their perspective we don't really uh comply with all of the descriptions of a permanently moored craft but for all f functions that basically we are in fact tied up uh, but if we get hit you know we might be stripped off the dock it would be a really interesting scenario uh, and a lot of different discussions to have about that as i mentioned earlier We've had uh, numerous discussions with the port pilots. Uh, basically, I've been instructed, you know, you have one one person to call, it's the port PD, and from there on, it'll be an interesting conversation. Not really sure exactly what would happen, but, uh, you know, how would we deal with it? Yeah, well, let me be clear. I think whatever ship hits a battleship is going to be on the, the losing end of the prospect <laughs> in some ways. Uh, although, I, I mean, as you well know, uh, battleships have all or nothing armor, so it depends on where you get struck and, and where it gets hit. Yeah. You know, th one of the things that Dolly has done is raised a lot of concern about how vessels come in and out of ports. Yes. And, you know, Dolly left Baltimore in standard operating procedures. There was there was no question about this. Two McAllister tugs took Dolly off the, off the uh, berth, got Dolly into the main channel, and then left. And that was normal procedure. And 99 point, ever how many nines you want to go out, times everything runs perfectly normal it's that point whatever zero one where it happens you know i sailed for a few years and i had two distinct in instances where ships lost power and i can tell you that the worst feeling and the worst sound you ever hear on a ship is silence yep. unless you're on a oh. sailboat it's the worst thing you ever <laughs> want to hear yeah, yeah. we're the because opposite thing, when the motor goes they, on that's a problem uh, <laughs> it is it is the worst i was actually bringing actually it was comfort we were bringing comfort into dock in bahrain I was on the fantail, kind of nodding off on the on the mooring lines, waiting to tie up. <laughs> and I was sitting back there. It was a nice, you know, it was sunny. I was just kind of sitting. I was like half asleep, just sitting there waiting to tie up. And she lost power, and and it woke me up like in a second. It was like it's like nothing has ever Jeez. woken me up as fast as silence on a ship ever does. And it's a it's the worst feeling in the world because you're not in control. Yeah. You're not in control. You've lost power. You've lost steering. You've lost all those elements. And so, you know, there are a lot of debates going on in ports right now, and I guarantee you L.A. and Long Beach is having this discussion right now. What should we do bringing vessels in? You know, a port like San Diego, which has the Coronado Bridge with, you know, if a strike on the Coronado Bridge happens and you bring that down, you literally pin half the Pacific fleet behind the bridge. You know, what everyone is starting to do is, okay, let's look at this. You know, there's no question, you, you know, there are some ports around the world that require tug escorts mm -hmm. with it. You know, if you come out of Valdez, it's pretty typical to have a big tractor tug hooked up to your stern as you're coming out of that region. But again, all that factors into costs, time, and the assets being available. Yeah. And, you know, in commercial shipping, the, 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 the denominator always is, how do I cut costs? And how do I maximize time? And if I got to sit there with a tug attached to me or a tugs have got to escort me, those are two or three less tugs that could be moving ships on and off of berth. Mm -hmm. And so there's always that that kind of yin and yang play that's going on here. What's going to be done? And I think right now everybody's is assessing that as we go. Yeah, and that, that occurs on our doorstep, as I said, literally every day. Um, the container ships tend to come into here with a tug on their stern, another one available. All of the oil carriers are, in fact, double tied. They have two tugs on them all the time in L.A., uh, five-knot limit right in front of the ship. Uh, but even then, it's kind of interesting. You, you sometimes see these tugboats digging in really hard just to slow the ships down. Some of these things idle at, you know, nine or ten knots. Uh, and just they don't really slow down very well at all. So we've seen them out here literally being drugged through the water under power. So it's interesting. And, you know, that's that's a danger too. be clear. Hooking a tug to a vessel, you know, you're towing that tug in some cases. Right. And there have been multiple issues where tugs have been pulled under and, and mm -hmm. crew members have been hurt or even killed when mooring lines and, and, and maneuvering lines snap. And so, you know, it, it's not like people don't put a tug on for any good reason, just for cost. There are issues associated with it. And it, it's long experience. It is, it is not an easy endeavor maneuvering through a channel with a tug on your stern that requires a lot of work by both the tug and the vessel. 
Uh, you got to make sure the lines aren't in the waters. You don't want to, you right. know, wrap one around a prop or in the oh, rudder. Yeah. So th there's a lot of issues. And this is where pilots come in. And I think really we need to empower the pilots a little more because pilots really don't have a lot of sway to, you know, require a ship to have tugs, you know, unless they have the backing of the port to do that. And in a lot of ports where pilots would make that, uh, sometimes, you know, the problem you have is if I if I require port, you know, tugs in Baltimore, for example, going forward, then some ship carriers may say, you know what, Baltimore is becoming a little too difficult to operate in. I'm going to go to Norfolk. Yep. Yep. LA and Long Beach are a little unique in that you guys are really the, the, the big players on the West Coast. There's not a lot of alternatives. So, I mean, you got a little bit more uh, leverage with that in the ports there. Yeah. And uh, to your point about cost, we've had tugboats on the battleship a number of times. Uh, we have these uh, surge conditions occasionally. We've had two two years, in fact, where we've had over $100,000 in damage uh, just from the surge conditions, which create what we now understand to be a seiche, where the ship is literally going north and south. But at $4,000 per hour per tug, this is it's a pretty expensive proposition. Exactly. Yeah, it's not cheap. To your point about silence, I totally get that. I've been on a vessel, you know, several times uh, asleep, uh, having been a, an engineer on, on watch or not on watch, uh, and suddenly everything goes silent and you wake up instantly. Um, one of the questions I had, in fact, one of the vessels I worked on but didn't wasn't sailing on, uh, here in L.A. we have occasional problems with power down here, uh, LA Department of Water and Power, not criticizing them at all, but, but you know, there's an occasional loss where at the end of the line, there's a switch problem, whatever. And so the vessel I was working on many years ago, we used to keep the emergency generator in the, the off or standby condition and uh, made sure and told the chief engineer at the time, switch it back to automatic before you leave. And in fact, they forgot to, and they got the vessel down off the East Pacific rise, ended up uh, switching generators just for the main ship service generators. Um, drop the load completely and nothing kicked on and they almost broached the vessel. So uh, mistakes can happen. And, and that was the first thing I was thinking about uh, uh, on the Dolly situation. Well, you, you know, one of the funny things about my channel <clears throat> that I started was, you know, where my channel really took off was in September of 2021, explaining the supply chain crisis, which was happening right yeah. there in July, mm -hmm. in, in, off the port of LA and Long Beach. It's, and I think one of the best, one of my first videos that ever w had any hits was trying to explain, you know, why are their ships parked off LA and Long Beach, you know, and and and, and I, I, that was, to me, really eye opening because a lot of people didn't have visibility. I mean, they see ships mm -hmm. all the time, they they you know may drive past the port or see things, but they didn't really understand it. And one of the issues I have with people in the shipping industry, and I say this all the time, is you cannot talk to human beings outside the shipping industry. Most people in the industry, they just can't. They they just they're really good at talking among themselves, but they can't talk to people outside mm -hmm. because and it's kind of like military. Military is, is, sure. is, you know, just absolutely famous for dropping acronyms every other yes. word so that nobody can understand what they're saying. And, you know, as a college professor and someone who's done a little bit of broadcasting, one of the things I, I think I'm, I could do is take a very complex subject and not dumb it down, but make it so that people can connect with it yeah. and understand it. And, and that's really what I spend a lot of my time doing. It's like, okay, this is what this means. This is why this is this is a problem. This is, you know, this is why, you know, why there are 109 ships off of L.A. and Long Beach. And it wasn't because there was a shortage of ships. We had plenty of ships. They were right there. We saw them all. You know, it was an issue of hitting into the infrastructure and why that happens. And now, you know, I spend my days talking about low water in the Panama Canal. I talk about the Houthis in the Red Sea, you know, and how this impacts global shipping. And, you know, I just I do like every week or two a video where I take kind of five stories, string them together and talk about this is what it means for you that this is happening in global shipping right now. Yeah. Fascinating yeah, I, stuff. I was going to say, so that insular conversation, I think, is why we started doing an event during our LA Fleet Week called the Leadership Summit. And we have a, a focus on maritime strategy. And actually, John Conrad came out last year and he helped moderate part of this conversation. And it was great. And it was funny because he started his kind of entry point into asking us, is it okay if I make the panelists a little angry? And we said, preferably not, but you can kind of push the limit a little bit. And it was great because, I mean, we had representatives representatives from the port, um, MSC, Marad, uh, some industry partners, and he wasn't afraid to kind of push the limit a little bit and ask them what's going on and how can we make this better? Because at the time we were coming out, of, we, the topic was kind of coming at the end of the supply chain crisis and saying, hey, where are the infrastructural opportunities to like improve here? What What's going on? What kind of policies do we need to look at? Things of that nature. Um, but it's the point of that entire event is to bring in all these different perspectives to 
help communicate. It's how do you take yeah. everyone out of their own silo and, and make sure that you can build these relationships. And that's extremely important. And that's not just the single event that we do. It's a lot of stuff that we do at the National Museum and kind of the Freedom of the Seas team that we have. But you're exactly right. Nobody knows who to talk to and how yeah. to talk to them to effectively respond or prepare for all these different scenarios. And, and the same is true on, uh, once again, DISCA is our acronym, Defense Support of Civilian Authorities, is it? I think it's authorities. Authorities or agencies. Agencies, yeah. Like and that. so it's really interesting, <clears throat> given that we talk to the military literally almost every day, you know, the Third Fleet or whoever it might be, uh, any any number of different military agencies that we're, we're dealing with for LA Fleet Week or other for other reasons, uh, we're actually kind of a go-between now between the Emergency Management Department of the city of LA and the, the military on the West Coast. It's really an interesting position to be in. And again, we're just providing that communication. It's, it's much like what you're doing on the maritime side. Yeah, I, I mean, it's almost it's almost like a translator at times yeah. mm -hmm. so that yes. they can understand it. And, you know, during the height of the supply chain crisis, I was talking to military all the time. And I was like, you really need to be studying this. You need to be focusing on this because what is happening in the supply chain is going to happen to you if you have to do an, an operation and go out through the supply chain. Because what you're seeing is and, and this is how I really got interested because because my doctoral dissertation was on the role of shipping in national defense. So I focused on military logistics. And what I realized is, well, civilian logistics, just like military logistics, it's all the same. It's it's just, you know, it, maybe maybe the hierarchy and the structure is a little different. But basically, it's the same thing. It's moving goods and, and through the interface that is shipping. And I, I highlight this all the time and talk to a lot of people about it. And what's really interesting is when you get a YouTube channel and you get a little bit of success with it, you get some visibility and all of a sudden you start getting phone calls from people you never expect yeah. to get phone calls from, you know, and all of a sudden you're talking to the assistant secretary of transportation, you're talking to, a, you know, the, the secretary of something other and some admiral or general or somebody like that. And it's like, it's like, this is, you know, what did you mean by that in that video? And you start explaining it. And I thought it was really important to understand what was happening with the supply chain and make it understandable to everybody because again it has an impact it has a global impact and one of the things we saw because of the global supply chain crisis was how easy it was to create a disruption globally and what we've been seeing since then is a series of disruptions that are basically resonating through the supply chain uh, over and over again, whether it's the Panama Canal with low water, whether it's the Houthi diverting vessels, whether it's a shutting down of the port of Baltimore, which is going to have resonance because one of the things I, I mentioned in a video and I had somebody call me about it and ask me about it is like, what do you mean by this? If I'm an insurance company and I'm insuring ships coming into the United States, I'm going to start relooking at where my ships are going because if you're going into a port that has infrastructure that's not protected, or there's not requirements, I may start caught, you know, charging you more because I don't want to get stuck with a two, three billion dollar bill yeah. to replace a bridge. I hate when that happens. And, <laughs> yeah, and that's gonna go, but that goes across everybody. Every consumer who buys something that comes in by ships, which is everybody, uh, you know, that's that's where that hits. And again, trying to explain that, if you try to explain maritime insurance, have a maritime <laughs> insurance lawyer explain yeah, maritime yeah. insurance, that's like, yeah, you're, we, you're not gonna. It's not gonna be understood by any human being alive. Yeah. Believe me, I know. I've talked to them. They, yeah, watched, they, they, they're not human. They, I, they they don't know what they're saying at times. <laughs> so when when I can like translate it, I think that's a really important thing. Yeah, not I, to be not to be unfair to maritime lawyers. I think anyway. a few of us watched that your your video about who pays basically. Yeah, yeah. And it was yeah. Awesome. fascinating to see how much of the maritime sector is still reliant on things that were set in the 1800s. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's incredible that we mm -hmm. haven't. Well, I don't. Maybe there has been a need, but we haven't really addressed a lot of those things because it's really setting a precedent for the crisis almost two hundred years later. Yeah, yeah. and, and pr much predicted was the the application in federal court uh, from the vessels owners and operators that uh, their their liability is limited to the residual value of the vessel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's an eighteen fifty one law that was used in Titanic. I mean, so you know they're basically making the argument we can't be more liable than the cost of the vessel and the cargo after. The voyage is complete, okay. so you got to deduct, you know, the bridge across the bow of the vessel. So you know, we're <laughs> we're actually crazy. using less than before. And and I actually had a, a group call me because they were working on proposals for legislation for space, for you know, uh, uh, basically you know, satellites and, and and proprietary issues in space. And they they asked me, it's like, well, do you think we should base our space law on maritime law? I said, no, no, <laughs> no. It's start fresh. <laughs> It's like start fresh. It's like don't do this because we're dealing with precedents that are, de I, mean, I mean, centuries old in some cases. It's it's really difficult at times. And we will break there because, as you can imagine, we went on talking for a while longer. We will save the rest of this conversation for a second podcast. 
If you have questions, observations, feedback, topics you'd like us to discuss, drop them in the comments or email us at podcast at labattleship.com. That's podcast at labattleship.com. Thanks for hanging out with us and we will see you soon for part two.